Hi everyone, good morning. Um, welcome to our seventh Insights in Action webinar. Um, it's super to see everyone here. Um, thank you for joining the IAB and Cantar South Africa. Um, it's a lovely day in Cape Town, um, so it seems outside and, and hope um, it's a good day for, for everyone. I know we are in very interesting times. Um, I hope you can all hear me. We are just um, letting a few more people into the waiting room, but without further ado, let's get started. We know we've all got busy, busy days ahead. Um, I also want to just extend a thank you before we introduce our speakers, a thank you to everyone here on the call today. It's fantastic to see such an incredible group of people from across our industry, all keen to learn more about retailing in South Africa at these times. Um, we have a various mix of um, publishers, brands and um, agencies both media production digital traditional through the line you know everyone's on board and um, also a special welcome i see josephine base from um, um prc is here our previous ceo from the iab just a huge welcome a huge welcome today and to many of our other special guests and uh, we hope you're all keeping safe and sane um, and um, we hope that today adds valuable insights to help you on our journey um, here together um, a note that our series of online weekly talks are powered by Kantar's bi-weekly surveys and um, to get a pulse on how the pandemic has impacted advertising spend, marketing strategies, business and business operations across our country um, we'll, and our industry, we'll hear more about the innovations, best practices and alternative measures coming into view that can help us all minimise our risk to businesses. Um, before we also get started to some online etiquette, you would have noticed if you were in the waiting room before we started, um, if you can um, turn your videos off, it just helps us keep the bandwidth light and the presentation sharp and focused um, and for the resolution and things like that. And you will have also noticed that your microphones would have been on mute when you came into the chat. That's just to help um, manage the noise so that we can hear Norman and Louise, um, who we'll introduce in a bit. Um, and without further ado, let me introduce our speakers for today. Um, ladies first. Um, so Louise Burgess, previously um, Marslin, is the co-founder, publisher and edit editor at Retailing Africa. And while I'm doing that, I'm actually just going to unmute um, them so that they can chime in. Just one second. Um, Louise, I'm um, just going to find you there. And Norman, and they have popped up to the top. One second. Um, here we go, I'm meeting Norman, um, and then Louise, we will unmeet you in a second. Um, so Louise has 20, over 20 years of experience in business to business and consumer publishing as an editor, publisher and content strategist specializing in the media, marketing, advertising and FMCG, um, FMCG retailing industry. She launched retailingafrica.com, an independent journalism driven site for the retailing sector in South Africa and Africa in February um, in partnership with, with Mark Loves. Um, Louise has a master's in commerce degree at, in strategy and organizational dynamics from UKZN's leadership center. So a big welcome to Louise. Um, and then because Louise and Norman are speaking in conjunction with Norman presenting first, I'll go right ahead and introduce Norman um, at this time. We're thrilled to have you on the line, Norman. Um, thanks for joining us. Norman is the retail, I see I've got a sound issue. I hope that's right. um, Norman is the retail sales shopper and shopper director in the consulting division at Cantal South Africa and is an experienced customer development leader with a demonstrated history of working in the consumer goods and retail industries across categories and channels with specialty in e-commerce. Um, he's passionate about campaigns that don't simply create awareness but go on to change consumer behavior. So welcome Norman and welcome Louise. Let me just unmute you Louise and Norman. Um, yeah, if you just wanna give a shout out and say hi and then we can upload your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Great. Happy, happy Wednesday. Super. Thanks, Norman. Um, great. Thanks. Um, Is Louise going to say hello? Yes, I'm trying to um, find Louise's um, chat name so that I can um, unmute you, Louise. Um, I'm just going to send her. On. Oh, I see. Okay, let me just, I found the answer there. One second. Um, um, Norman, if you would like to just continue for now, I'm going to just sort this out in a sec. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. Great. Great. Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to the discussion. And I really want to insist it's a discussion. I have a few slides to uh, bring the context to life. But let me start by saying it's a tough time in South Africa, as you all follow the st statistics uh, as I do. So my first important point is please uh, remain safe as far as you can remain physically distant. And this Paula taught me last night, social distance is tough because we do have social media, so we can remain socially close, but physical distance is gonna be the critical element to help us flatten the curve and manage this almost invisible uh, disease, quite, which is having a dramatic impact on us. So all through the conversation, please keep in mind that we're talking about real human beings going through a tough time across the globe. And today we really want to talk about how is this virus impacting shopping and what are the implications for what we call the part to purchase. Uh, and we can talk more about that concept as we go along. In Kanto, we are very good at understanding people because once you've understood people, you can then inspire growth. So let's have the conversation, please, as Paul has suggested, uh, put some questions in the chat. Uh, towards the end, we can have a conversation. We believe there are three things to be done as shoppers see the part to purchase change. The first one is to capitalize on the retail shakeup. So I want you, us to acknowledge there is a retail shakeup and let's talk about that. Secondly, to balance, or maybe we even say rebalance the touch point activation. Lastly, and very importantly, let's look beyond promotions uh, for sustainable growth, because promotions are just not enough. Talking about the retail shakeup, we've seen dramatic channel shifts and even the introduction of some new channels. You may be aware of, of uh, concepts like Zulzi and OneCart who are now facilitators or aggregators. They're not a channel in their own right, but they certainly connect channels. The retailer experiences have certainly changed. There's a word called quick adjustments. The word quick, uh, and historically we may have used that cliched frame, phrase, uh, change is the only thing that's permanent and consistent, but actually, you'd have to be quick in your adjustments because what happens today may change significantly tomorrow. We know that digital media consumption has increased over uh, many areas and has an increasing role in terms of how we influence purchase decisions. However, however, non-digital touch points will remain influential. We are very certain that physical retail stores will still remain important in our lives. We like promotions because they give us the, the concept that we're getting a great offer, but actually you've got to look beyond promotions and discounts to keep shoppers loyal and to make sure the offers you're creating land with the way we're dealing with lives nowadays, because we're all living from home. Uh, we talk about work from home, we talk about digital experiences, but actually life from home is happening right now and the world has changed for all of us. So I Norman, think our consumers... Sorry. It's right. Paula here. Just a quick jump in. Uh, it seems that for some reason when you loaded your presentation, it went into um, note mode. Could you just click the button that opens that up um, so that we can just see the full screen? We don't want to miss any of these juicy nuggets. Okay, let's have a look. Thank see. you. Louise, while Norman's busy doing that, just there is that better? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. And we've got Louise as well. Um, if you can just reshare, fantastic. We just seen your um, seen your video. There we go. Is that better? Uh, no, we're still in presentation mode. Is press escape or double click to exit? Um, no, still seeing the notes or the um, presentation mode. I'm sure we'll no. figure it out. Uh, no. Um, just trying to see, I can't click in terms of display settings. That's all good because lots of people are still joining on the waiting room. So hopefully we've had some advice here from um, Candace Goodman. If, um, oh, I just lost my chat there. One second. 
Love it when the audience reaches out to help. Thank you. Um, <laughs> if Norman clicks on display settings and then swap screens, I think might, might assist. Let's see. Otherwise, I can launch the PowerPoint from the side. Is that better? <clears throat> Let's see. Nothing yet. I think it's still loading on. There we go. Let's see. Holding thumbs. Thumb. <laughs> it's just loading. Is it um, it's just loading on my side. Louise, I don't know if you can see it. Yes. Oh, there we go. Yes. yes. Brilliant. Well done. Thank you, Norman. Okay, great. Good. So let's talk a, a bit about uh, point number one, which is capitalizing on the retail shakeup. So what we're observing is that there is growth in e-commerce and it is dramatic. Um, there's a data point I was trying to fetch, but I don't have it, but I think the principle is still clear. <clears throat> I think in 10 years, it took e-commerce from 2% contribution to like 15% across many countries across the globe. In the past four months, it sprung by more than 100 to 200%. So you can see the impact and the, and the catalyst for this change has been the coronavirus. And what we're also observing, if you look at the left-hand uh, bar chart, more categories are bought online for the first time. Not unsurprising, food ranks right up there, but equally over the count of medicines, cosmetics, personal care, and certainly clothing. What's also happened is in more markets, we see the growth uh, in countries that I think you may not have thought about, Saudi Arabia, and certainly South Africa ranks right up there, 50% of shoppers and consumers saying they are shopping for the first time in e-commerce, which is really powerful. It has accelerated growth of its user base. So certainly more people are doing more online shopping as well. But what's important, as I said earlier on, is that 31% of shoppers say they will go back to shopping in physical stores in the future. This is an important point to make because Consumers are responding in the moment to challenges they are experiencing, but actually there's still a yearning for you. And it's not surprising that some of them say, I'm doing this only now because that's what is required. But actually in the future, I will go back to going to a fruit and veg shop or walking the floor to buy the shoe that I want because I want to try it on and I'm not enjoying the online ex experience. And then the rate of new shoppers buying new categories or buying products or services for the first time certainly differs by country and category. And that's important to note because we certainly going to encourage you to continue observing what shoppers are doing. Because as we said, the behavior is changing consistently. So what you see in South Korea, 31% of shoppers are saying that they will revisit online shopping in online shopping stores in the future, whereas in Spain it's 40%. Conversely, in the other area where new products and services have been tried for the first time, South Korea is saying 41% of shoppers will continue doing it, where Spain is only 31%. So you see in both dimensions, it differs by shopping category as well as country. And we'll show you a bit more statistics now as to what it means for South Africa. There is a big challenge though, because online retailers and brands have the, have the, the real opportunity, because in the opportunity is a challenge. How do you keep on doing what's required in the future. And certainly a question I will have for Louise later on, how much of this will stick? And particularly the experience is a challenge. If you look at the top graph in China, 60% of shoppers are saying they find online a positive experience, whereas 29% of a huge amount of shoppers saying, I don't enjoy it, I find it challenging and difficult, and it's very likely they will fall off. Saudi Arabia equally very high, but if you look at Japan and France, they're not having a great shopping positive experience. And certainly some of them uh, are saying they'll probably go back to their normal lives. So again, re-emphasizing the point that the experience is important. And we'll talk about the experience a little bit now. Uh, but that is an important point for us in South Africa as we have a very diverse set of uh, population, shoppers, geographies, and even for some of us, it differs by region within South Africa. This is an important point here. One positive experience does not a preference make. 
So yeah, if you look at the graph and if you look at the particular line that says performance versus preference gap, what we're looking for here is that you want the, the difference between performance, particularly in China where it's 103 versus preference of 90, the difference is only 13%. What that means is that where you're getting great performance in your shopping experience for e-commerce and your preference is a good score, it's very likely that your shopper will stay in that channel or category. Particularly for China, there's an online retailer called VIP and you've seen that statistic. In Saudi Arabia, slightly different. Their performance is ranked at 105, whereas their preference is a bit lower at 83, which means your score of 22 is higher than China, which means that more shoppers in that experience are not having the same preference score. So whilst they enjoy the performance, it's not their preference. At worst, it's France, where performance is very high, but preference is low, which means your shoppers are going to drop out if you don't increase the level of experience. It's quite a, a different way of viewing uh, online shopping. Because in Africa, I know that for us, we have varying experiences. I know for myself, quite a few new apps have been introduced. What you're finding is half the stock is arriving, or it's arriving at a different time than it was promised, or the app is unstable, or the shopping basket that was promised is not online or difficult to find, or the search function doesn't work. So, so whilst the, the, the performance is also low, your preference scores will also dip, which means it's very likely that people who are having that type of experience will not come back to online very easily. So what you're seeing as markets reopen and offline channels adapt, because they are adapting and including the omni-channel experience, they are certainly better meeting the needs of a post-COVID shopper. Apple's got a good example, and many of you would have been to Apple dedicated shops where they now are certainly uh, creating some uh, physical distancing. And then brands like Coles, Best Buy, and the like are using curbside pickup service. I know for me, I've shopped down the road at uh, Pick and Pay on Nickel, and they have dedicated base right at the entrance for you to pick up after you've placed your order online if you would like that versus a <clears throat> delivery. Um, Online um, for clothing is more interesting in the sense that before you even go to the shop, you're powerful. This is one of my favorite, favorite slides. And Amazon, some of you may observe, are doing very well in this time. And, and the way Jeff described it is, is, is uh, certainly something I hold dear to me. Overperformers during this time are always serving the beautifully dissatisfied customer. What does that mean? It means that winning brands deliver a better experience. And actually here, yeah, it's important for us to think about staying in touch with what I call the, the complaints line, the query line. Are you very clear as to what's driving your shoppers nuts? Where's the experience failing? Where's the friction? We have a, we have a line at Kanto which talks about growth is found in uncomfortable places. And this is certainly uncomfortable. Because sometimes we're not clear on how to respond. And actually, the more you can unlock friction, it's very likely that your preference score goes up, your performance certainly will improve, and you're more likely to retain your shoppers to bring them back into your shopping experience, which is a combination of online and physical. It's clear from the data points we are observing across the world, and which includes South Africa, that 77% of overperformers are certainly achieving this and 22% of underperformance are struggling with this concept. And I'll come back to the slide a little bit later. But that's the first point we want to raise, which is how do you capitalize on the retail shakeup? The second point was about balancing your touch point activation. And certainly, personally, I've, I've experienced this, and certainly you will have as well, that across many touch points, some have improved and some have decreased. Certainly, if you look at the extreme right, the increased digital media consumption would have fallen off for cinema, rightly so. And I'm sure it'll trickle back in very slowly as level three starts becoming a permanency in our lives. On the extreme left, internet surfing. Almost everyone, irrespective of age, race, demographic, sociographic, will look to the internet for some source of information. Social networks are really powerful. The likes of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, even email, WhatsApp, SMS have grown dramatically because people are reaching out in the absence of physical contact. 
your next best option is another network. And so the list goes on, but certainly all the blue bars indicate through all the ways we've studied is that digital media consumption along all these platforms have certainly increased whilst radio, newspaper, magazines have decreased to the point where some of these channels have even disappeared. The point we're raising in this graph is certainly just that over time, as we've wave one has started at the beginning of the year and, and we had wave four quite recently, the digital touch points have certainly increased. But in, what's important here, they are playing a big role in the physical influence of how people live. So that's important to note. It's not one or the other. It's what we would call shoppers living in a, in a blended world. And a reference we could make is what we would call an omni shopper. In Medicare categories, digital touch points were already playing a key role influencing purchase decisions across e-commerce and physical retail. So what you're seeing here, if you look at the, the central line, above it is the e-commerce purchase journey, below it is the physical, physical retail purchase journey. So pre-purchase moments, digital played a 30% role in e-commerce, whilst in physical it was 25%. During purchase, certainly 40% of the contribution to e-commerce came from above the line. The next slide, using the same analogy, talks to that even in a physical world, these digit, non-digital points play a critical role in helping influence how shoppers go through a pre-purchase purchase and certainly post-purchase. And you see here, even in e-commerce, non-digital influences like word of mouth, in-store experience, sponsorship, TV, radio, play a role in how they view what they're experiencing in the digital world. Equally, and the same applies to the physical. It's certainly non-digital, but everyone who deals with a physical purchase journey still interacts in some way with a digital reference. A point I raised early on is that it certainly differs also by market and category. What we're seeing here, and for anybody who wants to have effective activation in this time and post COVID, you need to strike a balance between digital and non-digital touch points. So if you look at over the counter in Europe, the digital influence is 25%, whereas non-digital is 75%. In Africa, the continent we live in, the Connected Chopper study suggests that for beverages, only 5% is influenced digitally, whereas 95% is influenced, influenced non-digitally. In Latin America, for beauty and cosmetics, 30% is digital. So again, the implication here is for us is to think about for the world we live in, no matter which category, province, channel, shopping experience, you've got to think about how do you measure and understand what your shoppers are going through and how, are they, how do they influence what's digital and what is non-digital. Some examples to, to bring this to life. Certainly in cosmetics, uh, perfect. What they were doing is you could actually try online using exactly your smartphone to test new ideas before you went in and bought. So it's a virtual reality app, which is via WeChat in China. And I'm not surprised that this, it does exist in South Africa in some shape or form. You can actually look at what the effect could be before booking an appointment. That's a stunning way of integrating a digital experience before you even walked into a shop. For top shops, such as a fashion retailer, you are given the opportunity whilst you're looking at what you're looking for to book a personal appointment so that you know when you walk into that shop, you feel safe. What we're describing here though, are the varying touch points available to us now, which weren't available before. In some way forced and created through a transformation, but still relevant in a time of COVID. The third point in understanding the change in how shoppers have behaved during this retail transformation is to look beyond promotions. So certainly promotions are valid and still useful, but they're genuinely not sustainable and they are very costly way of getting to your shoppers. This is a big data point. 93% of consumers are worried that the crisis may return in a few months. Actually, we're hearing more and more that this virus will stay with us for a few years. What does that mean? And this worry has grown over time from wave one all the way into wave four. 
two thirds of our people are saying they're really worried. And we are currently experiencing all the great media and the immediacy of people losing jobs, reduced salaries, or the threat of these two risks in the near future. And because of that, quite naturally, shoppers are price sensitive. As households feel the negative impacts, uh, they're making very tough choices in a tough environment. So what you're seeing in, you look at the bottom left-hand graph, the impact is significant. What's more interesting for us as South Africans, we feel the effect mostly. Our fears are even more heightened versus other countries. In terms of price sensitivity, you look at South Africa, we 77% of consumers are saying they are growing more price sensitive to price. So, so what I'm talking about here is not necessarily that they're looking for cheaper options. They want to see how are brands and companies going to provide value. So whilst you're pressured to offer discounts and promotions, actually what's more important is relevance and value. This graph is an interesting one. It's, 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 a, it's the way the Chinese describe uh, growth for different categories. And I don't have a list of them. I should have brought a list with me. So we have high growth categories. Actually, your reliance on promotion should be less. If your catch business has limited impact, for instance, like bread or milk, you might not need to do lots of promotions. If you're a V-shaped category where the growth dips significantly and comes up quite sharply post-COVID, yeah, we may be thinking about uh, cigarettes, alcohol, and semi-luxury type goods. You may need to promote initially to bring people back in. If you're U-shaped, U-shaped just means that if you've struggled during COVID, it will take you a little bit longer to come out of this negative period. It means that promotion in some shape or form may be required. So that's the way to view that, that chart. But certainly what we're seeing is that there is pressure to change how you create offers. Norman, I think, I'm not sure if it's happening. Norman. We cannot overrely on promotions as these things tend to arise. Hi. Hi, sorry, Norman. I'm not sure if it's just, thank Gray. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm not sure if it's just me, but every now and then you just tweak out of um, audio. And I think it's if you're moving forward. <laughs> So um, it seems to work better when you're sort of centered and then you don't get any disruption in, in, in your voice. Um, maybe we can try that. Sorry to interrupt you. Just want to make sure everyone gets the, the insights. I'll try that. No, no problem at all. Great. There we go. Perfect. Great. So the point we're making is that brands cannot over on promotions because they definitely erode value. And certainly, as I described, they're expensive for everyone. I mean, they're expensive for retailers and brands equally. And it sometimes doesn't create genuine value for shoppers because they're not clear on what the price should be. And yes, yeah, some suggestions to brands or companies in terms of how you can describe value. So certainly we think about how could you be helpful in, in everyday life? How do you inform them in terms of their efforts to face the situation? in a mature, responsible way. How can we use a reassuring tone and really sound authentic when you talk to them, which plays into price because price is an important part of the value equation. How do you communicate brand values? And I'll give you an example just now. How do you offer a positive perspective on life? And so if you look at the statistics, South Africa ranks right up there. They, more than 80% of South Africans saying to us, please help us. Give us a great price, yes, but certainly help us cope in these tough times. Some examples we're seeing the brands are certainly dealing with this really well. If you look also at the toll points, are saying, please remind your shoppers to keep a safe social distance whilst you're brands to go beyond what they stand helping your shoppers. And this is a powerful one. You're in the queue, there's nothing more comforting than seeing this visual that gives you what we call a signal of safety. So you have the product playing a, an inclusive role in how we keep shoppers safe. The middle example is a cosmetic business, which is saying is we know you can't afford the whole 
item, yeah, some bite-sized eyeshadows you can try, and you can then mix and match the basket, which is really powerful because they understand consumers are under, under pressure. And whilst they're not going to reduce the price significantly, what they have done is reduce the size. So it's another way of playing with price without discounting deeply. The example about Yebo Fresh, I'm sure Louise will talk about a lot more later, so I won't spend too much time on it. But certainly it's this concept of convenience and really delivering essential items to a community under significant pressure. The word local is interesting because often people assume that it's just about locally produced, but actually it's, it's the communication. So consumers want to know that local means near me, near my house, close to me. The origin is somewhere around me. And increasingly people will favor local because they feel safer knowing it's produced locally or the services are delivered locally. It's not to, ex to the exclusion of imported products because imported products do impact our economy and certainly includes the labor force of South Africa. So you can help with that. You can pay more attention to the origin of products. Uh, consumers do say they favor buying goods and services produced in their own country, but it does not exclude imported goods. So sometimes people can misunderstand the statistic. <clears throat> Here are some examples. So Guinness is a good example. It's on messaging. Because if you wanted Guinness, you could get it. But you can be clear that at some point, a local component was included. Sourcing element happening in South Africa. Ula Box is an interesting one. Offering shoppers the opportunity to buy the online grocery basket via local community stores, which is interesting. So, irrespective of what the source was, the local community was able to access the basket. So, the concept of local is critical in how we deliver messages to shoppers, making them feel safe, sending signals of safety, and including their thinking and making them really understand that we feel for them during this tough time. So before I summarize, I'm bringing the slide right back in again. You have to deliver a better experience in this time. You need to understand these beautifully dissatisfied customers who are struggling to live with the virus, wanting a lot more, and expecting brands and companies to provide some sense of security as they go through life now and post-COVID. Whilst we're clear not everything will stick, we believe enough will stick for you to provoke the changes required in your organizations. So here are some of the implications. If you want to capitalize on retail shakeup, you certainly need to adapt your channel strategy. You need to optimize your shopping experiences, which means that these will ever evolve as consumers and shoppers respond. In terms of balancing touch points, you need to have synergistic effects between digital and non-digital. Your omni shopper is operating an omni channel mindset now. So you need to understand it deeply so you can respond appropriately across all the touch points they have. Looking beyond promotions is all about brand value in the context of a crisis. So, what messages are you putting out there? How are you helping people cope at this time? Is probably a lot more important than the deepest possible discount and a promotion. That's my summary. And this is the slide talking about the future. How do we influence shopper decisions in moments that matter? Isn't this a wonderful picture of how we'd love the future to arrive? So as I hand over to Louise, I want to ask the question, Louise, what kind of innovations are you seeing that are helping shoppers in South Africa. Sorry, Louise, we're just unmuting. We seem to have some technical glitches today. One second. There we go. Am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Norman, half your question disappeared. Were you asking about what some of the innovations are that we're observing in the market at this time? Yes, in the context of the crisis we're dealing with and the innovation required to help people live through this time, what are you seeing? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Norman, and thanks for that ama those amazing insights. Um, yes, we've had, um, obviously, Retailing Africa was launched only six weeks 
<laughs> before lockdown, but they say that uh, entrepreneurs thrive in chaos and the best time to launch a business is um, when the market has collapsed and during chaos and crisis. So we are testing that theory and uh, have had been having a wonderful time um, in terms of working through a crisis and being able to interact with thought leaders during this crisis as to how we need to get out of this crisis. And our tone has very much gone from the beginning of lockdown when we were all in a state of shock. And the kind of articles we were writing was, well, survival, what does lockdown five mean? And very much our tone has changed in the last few months to one of recovery and rebuild and one of hope and inspiration. And I think um, it's being driven by, by uh, thought leaders such as Canton, yourselves, IAB uh, webinars such as this, as well as, as brands themselves, who in the absence of celebrity culture and influencers who have gone dark during a time like this, brands are key influencers during a time like this. So brands that are really doing well are those that are reassuring consumers, being there for them, even if you can't sell. Um, when I interviewed the Castle Light brand director recently, they were putting out inspirational billboards because they bought the space. And when people started um, being able to go back to work at the beginning of lockdown three, they, um, before alcohol sales um, were allowed, just before, they were putting up inspirational billboards. They had the space, um, you know, reassuring consumers. And those are the brands I think that have won. Specifics, I think, uh, innovation we've profiled and had a look at were um, those that pivoted practically overnight. You mentioned Yebo Fresh. They went from being a, a delivery system into Izamu Yetu in Hart Bay, informal settlement. They went from delivering bulk uh, affordable food to families via mobile phones. So very high tech back end CRM system for consumers in terms of ordering, but low tech in terms of the fact that you could WhatsApp phone or send them send an SMS and delivery systems, anything from a bicycle to a bucket to a truck, direct to consumers doorsteps uh, in informal areas and their business overnight grew by 5000%. They went from five people to 50 serving informal areas all over Cape Town and as in the Cape Town, Cape Town Metropole um, and as far as the Northern Cape. And they also then were contracted because of their setup, their excellent tech setup. Um, and they, they were then used by organizations and charities to deliver over 10,000 food parcels to needy families. These literally were families who were starving after one week of lockdown. And um, they, the founder, Janine Boonstra, um, who has, who has, she's a Dutch national who has retailing experience in South Africa and overseas. She saw the need and she started her startup. And she says there's a need for 20 to 30 other Yebo freshers in South Africa and hopes that people will start more. Because when we talk about the acceleration of e-commerce, we talk about the 20% of the South African market. We're not talking about the 80% of the market that also need solutions who also live very far away from big shopping centers and big shopping malls, who also don't want to get into a crowded taxi to go and do a monthly shop. So what really needs to happen is innovation in that part of the market. That's, that's where it's needed. And I love the story and the pictures I saw um, of ShopRite taking their big trucks into um, informal areas so that people could shop during, during lockdown five so they wouldn't have to make a grocery shop. So that, that we need more of that innovation. We need more of um, using, using the Uber drivers who had no work for a while and may still not have work, who have cars um, to deliver groceries. We need more to invest in WhatsApp and um, other informal ordering systems so that we can cater to more of the market than those of us who are privileged enough to have a computer and uncapped data at home. I think the way the Bottles app pivoted during lockdowns five and four and still continue to do so, partnering with Pick and Pay to deliver groceries, um, I was so impressed with their, their, their structure um, and same day delivery of grocery essentials when we didn't want to go to the shops and um, I will certainly, that's one app I'll certainly continue using. I think Spa did amazingly well um, on a local level because that's what a, 
what the spa ethos is. You're a community store. And there were stories about a local spa that cleared shelf space for local suppliers, even the mom and pop baking goods to give them space to sell in local communities. Uh, I think it was in Plet. And then there was another story of a spa in Joburg that cleared out its stationery uh, when stationery was allowed to be sold again, they took out their stationery on shelf and to aid the small stationery shop in the mall. Um, and I think innovations like that and brands and retailers that, that really come to the party to, for their communities, because our world shrunk, our world shrunk to our suburb, to our street for a very long time. And it became about keeping our community safe. And it became about brands that made us feel safe and retailers that had the right um, um, PPE equipment for their staff. And we heard the bad stories, but I think they were more good stories and we all pivoted extremely quickly. There's a new innovation um, that the VNA are now trialing as well at the, at the waterfront. Um, they've partnered with Pango and they have a shipping container painted bright yellow in the middle of a bright yellow spot in the parking lot. They are trialing click and collect across major brands, everything from high end retailers, international brands, clothing brands, luxury goods, as well as groceries. So this is for office workers who won't be home now for deliveries. So you can order, set your time, drive through the v waterfront parking lot, pick up your goods, on your way home. So that's another uh, innovation. And then um, 6.50 uh, pivoted very quickly. It's a, it's a site that has digital currency and digital vouchers. They were going to roll out over Africa. Then of course, the lockdown and Corona happened and they pivoted extremely quickly and linked with the ShopRite group, which was a major coup for them. And they are launching uh, this. We're busy with, uh, the, we've done the interviews and we're busy with the story. They will be um, basically setting up a digital currency and digital vouchers. So you'll be able to register and you'll be able to send digital currency via SMS or WhatsApp or any other mobile link, even USSD. You'll be able to send this to people in need, your employees. They helped extensively uh, with wage bills um, uh, by making, through the digital currency system. In enabling um, weekly wages to be paid under under hard lockdown. So there's so much opportunity during a time like this. And I think you really see the innovation and the entrepreneurs come through. I remember once um, doing an Africa supplement and somebody said, um, entrepreneurs in Africa can do business on the sniff of an oil rag. We are entrepreneurial and it's because we find a need and then build a business to meet that need and in, and I think more altruistic, it's the Ubuntu principle. Profit comes second, need comes first. And if I can say anything to any brand and retailer out there, we've seen what's happened internationally. We've seen what's local. We will be buying local brands. That's the shopper behavior that will stick. Buying local, supporting our community, supporting South African brands. We are, you've seen the stats. Um, they are so high. South Africans are so pessimistic about the, about the economy. They are so pessimistic about the economic recovery because we've been through 10 years, a decade of poor political leadership and a decade of economic um, decline. So yes, we're hardest hit. However, the opportunity for recovery is also very high if we do invest in, in local brands and if we invest in our communities. And I think that's what will stick is this hopefully um, this more community minded um, ethos, um, supporting our community, supporting community retailers, supporting brands, supporting local, local, um, locally manufactured goods, locally sourced goods. goods. I hope so. Um, Louise, if I can add, I just think it's incredible to hear, you know, on the spectrum of innovation. I mean, often one thinks, you know, if you have to innovate, that it has to be this very expensive prototype that maybe works, maybe doesn't work, and that can be the case. But some of the examples you mentioned, probably, yes, there may have been an interim loss of funding, let's say, for example, where they cleared the shelves and brought in one of the smaller shops, the stationery. But, um, you know, that was a very smart idea. Um, it helped local commerce, it helped the community, but didn't take a lot of tech or build or, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of effort, I'm sure it had many sleepless nights, but um, it's just wonderful to hear the spectrum and that it, you know, some of these um, innovations are accessible um, to, to everyone, no matter where, you know, on the spectrum you choose to, to activate. And, and just wonderful to hear what the brands are, are doing. And an interesting note on 
maybe celebrities and, and other sort of brands that, that we call brands these days and, and who's kind of coming to the party. Um, so very interesting, thank you. Um, I want to just ask another question, if you don't mind, while we're talking about those innovations. Um, I think our industry, you know, certainly and you know, our industry of advertising, communication, marketing, creativity, um, you know, we've been known to lead the way in some um, aspects in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, do you see any of these, let's say, software protocols or brand innovations being applicable to outside the retail, or outside the advertising or product or marketing or brand um, sphere? So, for example, you know, schooling, you can just see all these um, sort of software and um, sort of these innovations that are helping from a marketing point of view or retail, just sounds like there's a really interesting model there for partnership outside of our industry that where we can assist. And, and I think there's quite a bit of that in, in place, perhaps, you know, more than I do. Um, but yeah, it seems that the hard work being done here with brands um, is very applicable to, to other industry and that we can be of great help. Every, every one that I've spoken to has not just looked at rolling it out in the retail sector. That's where the need was immediately, essential goods. Um, a lot of the, the entrepreneurs and startups and innovators we are talking to are looking at the rest of Africa too, um, because there are, this is our continent and there are similarities and there is a similar need. Um, I absolutely agree with you about education. I am a parent. I am not a teacher. I hate homeschooling. My child hates me teaching her. Um, it has been extremely difficult. I found an amazing educational free portal and I've been using great uh, videos to teach um, my, my grade two, um, who's not going back to school um, because she has asthma. So I have another three months of this. So any brand that can give me an, an easy way <laughs> to make schooling easier, um, I think I'll, I'll buy them forever. Um, I might even get shares. But um, I, I th I've seen a lack of that. I, I think in education, I wish more data service providers had come to the party and offered free data. Because when fees must fall, close some of our educational institutions. Friends of mine who are lecturers, who are lecturers got together, offices offered office space for students who didn't have data. Free laptops were given, uh, free data was shared. All that happened. But we're in this terrible conundrum we cannot gather we cannot share our resources we can't i can't homeschool five kids in my lounge because i have uncapped data and and a few and and a computer and, a, and an ipad and whatnot so during this time i wish there had been more solutions i think for children um we don't see them anymore out there i don't know if you notice there are no children in malls there are no children in shops they are home and there should have been possibly more brand involvement uh, and support for families. Um, I don't have the solution, but when it comes to education, I feel more could have been done. I didn't see brand support on this free educational platform uh, where educators and digital people came together to use real teachers to record real videos for every single grade for the entire CAPS curriculum for three months. It has been a lifesaver for me uh, in particular because you have a live teacher. You can't interact, um, but you have a live video. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that kind of thing. There should have been brands putting their money behind that, I think. No hard sell. This is about support and empathy at this time. Um, so we know that the hard sell is not there, but I think brands and, and, and that support families at this time, that support mental health, that support health and safety, that are reassuring. If you can't sell and you know no one's going to buy your luxury product right now, but you still have brand spend, you still have billboards booked, you have ad spend, use it to reassure and remind us of what makes us unique as South Africans and what we are missing and what we will get back to. I wanted to ask Norman that question, whether there is in all their research and, and, and looking internationally, even though we know, we don't know how long COVID-19 will be with us, are there timelines um, as to when we can return to normal? Because we want to focus on that. We want to have hope. Think about children kept home without friends for six, seven months. That's what I'm grappling with. What will be the impact on them? How do you give a child hope when the entire world has been restricted to a room or, or a house and they haven't been able to play with their friends for months and months? Um, you know, what, what hope can we give? What, what can brands do? Norman, are there any international examples we can draw on? I think we need to unmute Norman.
Okay, I'm unmuted. How's it? Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the most recent example we have is China, where so, a lot has returned to normal, but equally what's also happened is some of the, as you will see in Wuhan, some of the virus also has returned uh, because human beings now interacting a lot more. What's clear for us there were, there were if, you, if I remind you one of the slides I showed you, one of the spectrums you've got to think about is that depending on the category, for instance, Louise you and Paulie rightly described, luxury goods will take a lot longer, up to years. <laughs> and that's the harsh reality. Clothing, medium term, and certainly the immediate consumption goods like uh, fruit and veg that you weren't able to access because either farmers or retailers are making different choices or they just weren't able to, to, to get enough to supply. So it varies by category. And the, the important point you raised on is about signals of safety. The best thing brands can do is position signals of safety together with their brand purpose. When you combine those two forces, they become powerful to, to encourage shoppers to shop whether it be online or in physical stores, doesn't matter, or to engage more with products. So a lot of it lies actually in the hands of brands and companies to do that. The example I think I saw in South Africa was quite powerful was Life Boy, where they uh, said to consumers, the best thing you can do is wash your hands, not just with Life Boy soap, with any yes. soap, which to me was a powerful category proposition which did not enforce or reinforce their own debt for society at large. And then it, because we actually largely in, in not in control, but we get high influence on what normal, some of it will be new. How much is dependent on how we then activate our, our activities and help consumers get back into normalities. Absolutely. I think we'll see. Oh, sorry, Louise, go for it. We've got. Um, no, no, I was just going to say thank you. Um, I, I think I think it's, it's, it's reassuring and, and, and we mustn't forget the sectors that are in need. Education is massive. Fear amongst families is massive. Um, and and that somehow needs to be addressed and reassured because if you're a parent, you're reading everything there is right now about going back to school. You're being inundated with pamphlets about safety. Your kids are having to sit in hula hoops. Um, it's not so much that we are afraid of them getting the virus. We're more afraid of the impact on their mental health of not being able to play together, for example. So, you know, um, there, are, there is opportunity. Are there play learning platforms? I heard in interesting stories about how company Zoom meetings that became tiresome and, and um, uh, staff were getting Zoom fatigue and not wanting to participate and those locked down alone were getting really bored and, and depressed and they started setting company Zoom meetings in, on, in the online gaming world. So you could be sitting around a campfire, you had to fight off a T-Rex to make it into the meeting and, you know, interactive fun things like that. And mm -hmm. I think schools, particularly most of our schools are under-resourced. Um, government usually only pays 25% of a government school's costs. Um, you know, are there, is there support that brands can give to half the school kids aren't going back because of comorbidities or they will get COVID and they'll have to stay home. How can brands right now jump in to help families and schools uh, navigate the online reality of the kids in the classroom and those who are going to be home going some days at home some days staying home for weeks if they think they're sick or if there's an outbreak and the schools closed again it's con consistency continuity support and reassurance i think one has to look at those words and that tone plus hope and inspiration we can't just live in this twilight dystopian world of fear um, which we see every single time. My daughter doesn't want to go to the shops, apart from the fact that her eyes burn from the disinfectant being sprayed everywhere. Um, it's not normal enough and it's not real. Um, and and, and um, she doesn't want to have to see people wearing masks. So, you know, it's, 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 it's fears like that. And we're going to, this is going to be with us a long time. So how do we make it fun for kids? Um, you know, there's, they're being inundated with coronavirus advertising on the kids' channels. Um, they're getting a bit tired of it. I know it's an educational, but the um, feedback from my eight-year-old doesn't want to be reminded of the virus every five minutes between Peppa Pig and um, um, Pokemon and whatever else they're watching. So we need to start thinking ahead and dealing with the, the mental health implications of families being locked down after three months in, in less than ideal conditions for so many, going to school in very 
very restrictive conditions. So what does that do to us? Um, how can brands fill that gap? How can they help? What are they? We're going to be online for a while. We're going to be using our mobile phones for a long, long time to interact with many of these things and services. How can brands plug in there? I think a lot more should have been done to give free data to communities in need. Thanks, Louise. Um, absolutely, and very strong messages. I think um, I'm going to cross over with, to you, Norman, with a question from our audience, which links to what Louise was saying. And just to close off from what you're saying, Louise, I think you know there are almost two vital, well, they're probably more, but two very powerful psychological, you know, behaviours that we're looking at. One from a business side, where we're having to step outside our comfort zone in terms of partnering with competitors outside our industry, doing our job and more and more and more to help us all sort of along this journey together. So I think the psychology around that's very interesting for our industry. And I've seen a lot of great examples. Um, and, you know, I know you share copious amounts of them on your website and, and Canto. I've also got fantastic case studies um, that we've been sharing in this journey together. And then I, the other one is exactly as you mentioned, fear and, and trying to, to work out how we engage going forward and, and for the long term. I think, we're, as we've mentioned earlier, this isn't just, you know, a short term um, piece to manage. Um, and just speaking of, of the long term, um, Norman, the question here to you was um, from Satanga. Satanga, what kind of experience should e-commerce platforms offer to reduce the outflow of consumers post-COVID? And maybe the hook in that question is post-COVID and, and maybe there is no actual post-COVID. But, um, you know, in terms of you've managed to capture an audience, um, a new audience, they're, they're loyal, they're grateful, you know, maybe something like, the examples that Louisa shared earlier, they're grateful and, and you want to keep them on. Um, is there any particular um, insight that you have sort of to keep, keep, them, keep them with you? It's quite a big uh, There's question. probably a few. So the, no, the, big, the big principle is going to be relevant. So how do you stay relevant during and post COVID in a digital framework? So the first thing to understand why are consumers buying into your e-commerce site, no matter what you're offering. And then you've got to like list a couple of points on what's relevant, what's keeping them in, and then anticipate the risk. So the, the risk with uh, things like the, the, the 60 minute promise from checkers is a good example. How do you keep people buying post COVID? Well, make sure that experience is really powerful and over time build on that experience. So the first thing is deliver the fundamentals really well. If you promise 60 minutes and you promise 5,000 items, that's what you must do. Any, any compromise there, you're likely to see fall off. Then once you've nailed that, literally nailed it, got it packaged really well and the systems are well oiled, you got to think about what then adds value because there's three ways to grow your, any business, right? It's the absolute penetration, number of shoppers you can keep in your business. Secondly, how do you manage frequency? And frequency is really about what brings them back to buy things they're looking for. Thirdly, it's what we call the waiter purchase, the number of items in the basket. If you know someone's got dog food and you know that the dog was one kilo, now it's two kilos, are you gonna think about offering two kilo later on because you know the dog has grown? If it's dog food, what else do you add to the category? What are the associated items? If someone bought shoes, but honestly and simplistically, they're going to need socks. If they bought bread, it's bread and milk. And those are the three ways we think most businesses should apply the model to grow. It's number of shoppers, frequency of the shopping trips and and certainly the, how do you improve the basket and that comes from then again what i talk about really understanding your dissatisfied customers what's driving them nuts what are the things that are missing in the shopping program or along the path to purchase that you can satisfy better than your competitors or be more anticipative of the change Great. Thank you, Norman. That I was <laughs> expecting such a brilliant, concise, it's such a big question. So thank you. I think that's something that people can really take away and build on. And, you know, I think it is so important to get it right first um, and, and make sure that you can deliver on that initial promise. And then how do you expand and continue to reduce friction? And I think, you know, um, there's so many online tools that are available so that we can listen to our customers for free. We can really keep in contact and understand those friction points and, and address them, um, you know, head on and, and hopefully improve our business um, as, as we do so. Um, I've got another question here um, and perhaps to both of you. Um, and perhaps it's a discussion all into itself. And I know at the IAB, we're also working on, you know, the new 
the puppy code that's come in um, with the new, well, the new date, certainly for next year, um, and, and how children, you know, and privacy for children. And, and this question is related to data um, on the power of children in online retail decisions um, and even online purchasing. And, um, you know, and similar to the data that's been available um, or, or on store, is, is there any information about children's capacity to influence online buying? I mean, I could probably speak to that. Um, as I admit, my daughter's gaming habits, but um, <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, is there any information on children in online retail decisions, um, or we perhaps we can cover that as a separate subject? Um, Louise. Louise, have you, any, have you seen anything? <laughs> Paula, I think you. I think you need an entire hour on Generation Absolutely. Z and the impact they're going to have. Um, I do Great. work for an NGO, a youth NGO, and I was in a webinar couple of weeks ago with um, young generation Z and they just want to be listened to they want to be part of the conversation they want to influence national policy they are angry that um, they are not listened to by government policymakers because they've been at the forefront of assisting during this pandemic in amazing initiatives like translating the official language used to explain um, how social distancing and physical distancing and the other health regulations around COVID-19 uh, in, in the vernacular um, by, by setting up a face, the one um, young person set up Facebook um, online radio station to get information out to his community about the dangers of COVID. They have been working as community workers. They have been delivering medicines. Um, they have really, the youth have been, been at the forefront in our communities, particularly our informal communities and townships, um, in helping um, communities understand and, and getting essential services and food, just delivering food parcels and being there. They're young, they are keen, they are much savvier than we were at that age. This is a generation that really at the age of 20, think like 30 year olds uh, from our generations. Um, and they need to be involved at every single level. And any brand that is not, does not have Generation Z on their youth panel, or is not looking at how they are going to influence buying habits, how they are going to come out of COVID-19 after having to realign their dreams of studying or getting a job or having a country with a functioning economy, how they're going to come out of this is going to be studied. And this is going to be the generation that will change the world because they are the ones who have to now fix this. The uh, COVID-19 and whatever the economic impact is in Africa, we have the youngest population and the largest amongst number of youth and also the most digital savvy generation of access to education in many aspects um, through online tools and through community tools and through networks. I think than never before. And if we can harness this for the power of positivity and recognize that they have a voice and listen to them and hear what they have to say, we will be a better functioning society in the long run. In this next decade, Generation Z will influence absolutely everything from education to purchasing behavior, to how we shop, to what they do online, how they use mobile phones, how, how they, live culturally from culture to everything um and we need to listen to their voices during COVID. we need to listen to their poetry we need to listen to their songs we need to listen to the music we need to listen to the online forums TikTok is an amazing platform if you want to do brand research into what young people are saying during COVID 19. look at the movement look at what they did to donald trump's tulsa rally it was 16 year olds who booked all those seats and and um uh, the, 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 it's been reported by mainstream media, so it's it's a pretty true account that he ended up with 6,000 people in a 19,000 seat stadium because teenagers booked those seats and you had political commentators in the States only finding out on the day it happened, whereas for two weeks this had been discussed in social media. So if you want to know the power of this generation to break, make or destroy your brands, Generation Z are the ones to watch. And I think you need a whole separate session on that. Thanks. And yes, they will influence absolutely everything and already are. Thanks, Louis. Absolutely. And thanks to Leonie for asking that question. I think maybe a great segue. We'll be chatting to the, the team after this and planning our next couple of sessions. So I think we've got our next um, you know, insight on, on what we need 
more information on. And I think just to comment that the debt on the chat is just sharing some really great um, notes and just saying that this generation wants ac action, um, clear insights into how they are driving purpose. Um, and, and Yvonne saying, yes, please, a Gen Z session would be great. So I think, um, yeah, really, <laughs> really useful way to seg section into the next, into the next one. Um, we have run out of time. Uh, we've actually gone a bit over. It's just been such a, such a good discussion. Um, so thank you. Um, Norman and Louise, is there anything you'd like to share before we, before we close off? Um, yeah, I'm just getting a lot of thank yous on, on the chat as people are needing, needing to head off to their next meeting. But um, anything you'd like to, to add? Yeah, just final um, thoughts. Stay close to your shopper. If, if not through formalized research, through Cantor Insights, at least keep talking to friends, family, look at social media. And, and in terms of being responsive, agile, and quick and nimble, try new things. You see a trend, jump onto it. So listening to your shopper right now is critical because what happened last year is not relevant now. What happens now may not be relevant in a month's time. So staying close to your shopper is critical. That's completely true. And take risks. Now is the time during a crisis um, to innovate. Um, because if it doesn't work, try something else. Um, keep trying, doing different things, pivoting your business. Uh, look at what's happening internationally. We're lucky. We can follow many of the international trends because we, we, we're only entering our peak. And if the medical data is right, South Africa's in for its most heartbreaking time in the next two to three months, our winter. And brands need to reassure and give hope with their messaging because um, the fear levels are starting to escalate. You can see it on social media. We've had it in Cape Town for quite a while. I can see it from my friends in Joburg. It's getting closer. We now all know someone who's had it recovered and maybe anecdotal evidence of families who've been affected by deaths. So now is a time for, no, for reassurance and empathy. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, Norman. Um, we will be sharing this, um, the video recording on IAB YouTube on the Insights and in Action playlist. And we will be sharing the presentation um, in the thank you note. Um, and it will also be on Kantar's Insight and in Action webpage. Um, if you've got any other questions, just send them through to me. Um, my email address is in all the communication and we'll gladly pass them on to Louise or Norman or, or anyone else who can help. Um, you can also check out, um, you can email um, IAB Goodworks, I'm um, sorry, Goodworks at IAB.coza if you're an IAB member and doing great things and we'll happily share that with our community. And um, yes, absolutely. And to thank our speakers for all your time and your energy today. Just a really important time to have this discussion and thank, thank you for you. all the insights and hope it's a good week. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Louise. Good stuff. Ciao. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.